Greetings. Welcome to my podcast that features my book, Colonial American History Stories, 1215 through 1664. Jacques Cartier laid the seeds for French colonization of Canada in 1534. On April the 20th, 1534, Jacques Cartier departed St. Malo to explore the Canadian coastline. After King Francis I commissioned him, Jacques Cartier departed on the first of great voyages of discovery. He sailed from the port of St. Malo, Brittany. Jacques Cartier lived from December the 31st through 1491 through September the 1st, 1557. Jezeline Jessart presented her husband, Jamé Cartier with a son on December the 31st, 1491 in St. Malo, France. We know very little of his childhood. Historians suspect that he received navigator training at Dieppe, France. Many think he sailed with Giovanni de Varenzo during his 1534 explorations along the Brazil coast. It is certain he had gotten valuable sailing experience somewhere. He, gained, <clears throat> he had gained enough experience to give Jean Le Vignard, Bishop of St. Amalo, confidence in him. The bishop introduced him to King Francis I during a meeting at the Menor de Brion in Normandy. During the meeting, he cited previous voyages to Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Brazil as proof he had the ability to lead an expedition. The impression on the king must have been favorable. King Francis I had already met with famed Florentine explorer Giovanni de Vazzarano. The king decided instead to commission Cartier. The European powers at the time searched diligently for the fabled Northwest Passage. By this time, they knew that North America was a large continent that lay in the way of their desired route to Asia and the riches it possessed. Francis desired to become the first European king to discover it. It was for this purpose that he commissioned Cartier to explore the northern lands to find a way through them. His commission directed him to find his passage and collect gold, silver, and spices along the way. Cartier's expedition consisted of two ships and 61 men. They set sail from St. Malo on April the 20th, 1534. The port, Cartier's home, is the northwest coast of France in the English Channel. After a voyage of 20 days, he reached Newfoundland. After exploring Newfoundland, he sailed his ships into St. Lawrence Bay. He discovered Prince Edward Island and Anacosti Island along the way. Anacosti Island was its furthest penetration west on this voyage. He, his route was a loop that entered the bay through the Straits of Bell Island between Newfoundland and the mainland. The ship sailed along the western coast of Newfoundland and then southwest to Magdalen Islands. At Prince Edward Island, they headed north to Anacosti Island, uh, Island and, back, and then back out the Straits to return to France. He had three contacts with Amerindian tribes on this voyage. Two occurred in Chalour Bay. There, they were, these were on the north shore of the bay, currently part of New Brunswick. There was minimal amount of trading during these encounters. The third encounter was in Gas Bay on the Gas Peninsula. Here they encountered a party of St. Saint Lawrence Saint Iroquoians. Here he set up a cross inscribed, Long Live the King of France. He then claimed the area for the King of France. The crew also kidnapped two of the Iroquois before leaving. It was during this encounter that he probably first used the name Canada for this new land. The Iroquois called the village or settlement Kanata. Carter adopted the name for the new land, which eventually extended to all of Canada. By September, the, by September 1534, Cartier returned to France, carrying the two Amerindian captives and the belief that he had been in Asia. Pleased with Cartier's report on the first voyage, King Francis I approved the second voyage. Jacques Cartier and a crew of 110 men set sail on three ships, the, the Grand Hermine, the Petite Hermine, and the Ermillion. On May the 19th, 1535, the two Amerindian boys they had kidnapped the year before, Dom Aguaya and Taigonokami, I, like I said, I can't, I, these Indian names mystify me. Anyway, the two boys accompanied them. The boys would serve as interpreters and guides on this voyage. After a voyage of 50 days, the small fleet reached the St. Lawrence River on July the 8th, 1535. The boys guided them up the river to their village, Stag de Conda, the Iroquois capital. The Canadian city of Quebec now stands on the site. 
They established a post at the mouth of the St. Charles Rivers and settled in after deciding to spend the winter in the new land. The spot provided a natural haven for the ships. High bluffs sheltered the ships from strong winds and the currents kept the ships from drifting downstream. They had only stocked provisions for a 115-day voyage. Cartier thus set men to task of salting fish and stocking provisions for the winter. Cartier and some of the crew continued exploring upstream in the smallest ship, the Ermillion. They adapted it. They had adapted it for shallower waters for river travel. Sailing upriver, the Ermillion reached the Amerindian village of Hochelaga on October the 2nd. Montreal now occupies this site. Jacques Cartier Bridge marks the spot that historians are confident is his landing place. The city was much bigger than Sta Stadacona, and well over a thousand natives met his ship. These natives told him tantalizing stories about a sea that occupied the middle of the land further to the west. They also assured him that great riches of gold lay to the west. Also, however, rapids blocked this forward progress, convinced that this was a fabled northwest passage and that China lay just beyond those rapids, he named them the Lachine Rapids and the river the Lachine River. Lachine is the, present, is the French word for China. Since their settlement lay south of the latitude of Paris, the Frenchmen expected a mild winter. No European since the Vikings, 500 years before earlier, had experienced a North American winter. What they experienced shocked and almost killed them. From the beginning of November until May, the river froze, locking their ships in a thick layer of ice. In addition to the cold and privation, scurvy soon afflicted both the Amerindians and the Europeans. The disease began killing Cartier's crew. Insufficient supplies of vitamin C caused scurvy. Early, the disease causes appetite loss, diarrhea, rapid breathing, fever, irritability, swelling and bleeding, and paralysis. Later stages include bleeding gums, loosened teeth, protruding eyes, anemia, and finally, death. It is a long, painful death. The cure for the disease is simple. Just consume sources of vitamin C. The disease at this time was well known. It was mostly associated with sailors who would go to sea with long periods with no fresh fruits or vegetables. No one at the time knew the cure or the cause. The French noticed that the Amerindians also suffered from the disease but re would recover after a time. The French, not recovering, grew desperate for a cure. They implored the Amerindians for the cure. However, the natives were re hesitant to share their medicine with outsiders. At length, they told them that a tea made from the boiled bark of the white cedar tree would cure the disease. The French gathered some of the bark, prepared it, and drank the tea. It provided almost immediate relief, and in a few days they had stripped the bark of one whole tree. But they lived. By May, the ice had thawed and the ships were free. With 25 less men than he started, Cartier sailed for France in mid-May. The next episode relates the explorations of Hernando de Soto.